Hey, everyone. Welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I you again to be. Ring Bustamante Adams. I hear Irene. I don't see her, but I hear her. Lower left corner. Jerry Merritt, I'm here also. Welcome, Jerry. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Lisa, this is Jaime. Check it in, I'm here. Thank you, Jaime. Much appreciated. Jaime, since we have a minute, where did you get that awesome jersey? I want one of those. Yeah, uh, Hugh, Hugh knows my secret. I'll tell you later. <laughs> he's got a three-story closet just for his jerseys. He's the, <laughs> the Emilda Marcos of jerseys. <laughs> All right, we have uh, one more minute and then we'll get started. He can't start till when? Oh, oh wow. All right, let's get started. Welcome committee members and members of the public to this March 15th, 2023 Governor's Workforce Development Board Executive Committee meeting. For the record, my name is Hugh Anderson, Chairman of the Governor's Workforce Development Board. Katie, will you please take roll call, confirm a quorum and verify most of Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Katie Gilbertson for the record. So we have Sir Anderson. Here. We have Lisa Levine. Present. Uh, Crystal Slaughter? Present. Jerry Merritt? Present. Vice Chair Ken Evans? He'll probably be joining on. Uh, Councilman Black? <coughs> uh, Robert Benner? Present. And finally, Jennifer Kaiser. See your name on here. Ms. Kaiser, can you please mark yourself present? Catch her at the end. Okay. All right. Mr. Chair, Katie Gilbert's doing Governor's report for the um, for the record. I hereby affirm that this March 15th, 2023 Governor's Workforce Development Board Executive Committee meeting has reached a quorum. And I further affirm that the agenda and notice for this meeting were publicly posted pursuant to Nevada's open meeting law, NRS 241020. Thank you, Katie. Ms. Kaiser wasn't able to unmute, but she just uh, sent a message that she is in attendance. Thank you. Awesome. All right, before we proceed, the chair kindly requests that anyone who speaks today to identify themselves for the record. And continuing on to agenda item number four, public comments. Members of the public on remote technology are invited to provide comments at this time. No action may be taken on any matters during public comments until the matter itself has been included on an agenda as an item for possible action. Do we have any public comments on the telephone? How about Zoom? Seeing none, we'll move on to item number five. Is there any discussion before I call a motion to approve the January 19th, 2023 Executive Committee minutes? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion for approval. Motion. Uh, who is that? Who is that, please? Crystal Slaughter, for the record, I make a motion. Thank you, Crystal. Do I hear a second? Jerry Merritt, second. Thank you, Jerry. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? 
Please let the record show the motion carries. <clears throat> Moving on to item number six, for possible action, the chair recognizes Janice Klein from Janice Klein from, from Dieter to discuss the revisions to state compliance policy, SCP 5.9 state compliance policy procedure. Janice, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Janice Klein, ESD Program Chief for WISP. Um, once again, we have another state compliance policy 5.9 that we are seeking approval for. This policy has non-substantive changes. They are all housekeeping items. There's three pages to this policy. Anything that's highlighted on it are the actual changes, strike throughs, um, are verbiage changes, and we're seeking approval um, from the executive committee. Katie, are you able to put those uh, that exhibit up on the screen real quickly? Yeah. If not, great, Janice. Uh, as you know, we're trying to streamline the non-substantive uh, changes exercise that this board is responsible for. So. Uh, this month, I just wanted to uh, put this up so you can uh, quickly identify uh, what we what you define as non-substantive so the, uh, the the committee can be comfortable with uh, voting on it. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Katie. So on the very top of page one, it actually just deleted the Act of 2014, not needed. It's the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. As we go further down, the originating mm -hmm. office WIS used to be called Workforce Investment Support Services. Um, I'm trying to get it up to date, current with Workforce Innovation Support Services. So changes like that. Um, and these changes on the next line updates are effective March 15, 2023. Um, this directive may contain, it had a plural of S on there, so we took that off. A lot of this is really just housekeeping items, um, grammatical issues. Katie, can you go down to number two, page two? So in this section here, it, it said State Workforce Development Board, which is the Governor's Workforce Development Board, so that was changed. Um, considerations by the state actually puts WIS, Workforce Innovation Support Services, before final action. Um, they really are just very, very basic changes. Th these are old policies in here. It refers to a state board instead of the governor's workforce development board. So that change has been made. Katie, do you mind going to the third page for me? Um, and then on the third page, again, it refers to WIA, Workforce Investment Act, which is now the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. So that change has been made. Also, it is no longer Owen, it is Goen, and the website links have been updated on the very bottom of this policy. Excellent, thank you so much. You're welcome. Do we have any questions for Janice from the committee? All right, with that, I will entertain a motion for approval. Ken Evans, so move. Thank you, Ken. Do I hear a second? Rob Check in, Scott Black. Thank you, Scott. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Please let the record reflect that the motion carries. And just as an aside on this particular exercise, as you all know, we're not trying to uh, not give the due respect to the responsibilities that we have for overseeing these kind of uh, changes to the documents. We just want to make sure that if they are quote unquote uh, non-substantive that uh, we dismiss them as quickly as possible and get uh, focused on the other things. When they are substantive, we rely on folks like Janice to uh, make sure that uh, they are brought to our attention in good order. So again, thank you, Janice. We appreciate the time. Thank you much. All right, moving on to agenda item number seven for discussion and information only. The chair recognizes policy analyst Sylvia Yeager and senior policy analyst Jack Porter from the National Governors Association to report on best practices regarding title report updates. 
At the last full board meeting, there was a disconnect between the metrics that were presented during the title reports and what the board members wanted to see. So we have invited the National Governors Association to inform us on innovative strategies based on nationwide research to make the title reports more efficient. And we appreciate both Ms. Yeager and Mr. Porter being here after hours uh, to educate us. So thank you for your time and we look forward to hearing your, your comments. Perfect. Thanks so much, Chair Anderson and Katie Hugh. It's or, or Katie and uh, and Ken. It's good to see you. And thanks uh, so much again for attending our uh, Winter Workforce Symposium last month. It was great to have you in town. Um, uh, I'm Jack Porter, a senior policy analyst on NGA's uh, Workforce Development and Economic Policy Team. We're very excited to be here to learn a little bit more about how we can be helpful and kind of lift up a few state examples as well as kind of identify ways that NGA can be helpful to uh, its members and to state boards. Um, so, Sophia, please go to the next slide. Oh, so, super briefly, before jumping in, um, just to lay out NGA, uh, we were founded in 1908. You can see a fun little photo on the left side of your screen there with uh, President Teddy Roosevelt with the first convening of the nation of the National Governors Association uh, in 1908. Uh, and we are the nonpartisan organization of the nation's governors. Um, we effectively have two sides of the house here at NGA. We have the Center for Best Practices, uh, which is where Sophia and I sit, uh, which is the only research and consulting firm uh, that directly serves governors uh, and their executive branch leaders. Uh, and on the other side of the house, we have our government relations team, um, which, as I'm sure you all know, just every governor has um, one or two or a few staff here in D.C. to, to, to maintain a presence um, and, and advocate for their interests uh, here in Washington. Next slide, please. Great. So within the Center for Best Practices, we're just kind of listed out our, our different program areas. We're all the way at the bottom there of the alphabetical list, our workforce development and economic policy team. Uh, but as you can see, we have uh, about a dozen programs, including things ranging from energy, cybersecurity, infrastructure, um, public health, public safety, kind of runs the gamut of policy issues that are facing uh, governors today. Um, and the different types of services that our teams can deliver are kind of listed there at the top of the screen at a pretty high level. Uh, customized technical assistance, um, including, you know, if you have a question about a different a policy issue that you all are facing, we're more, we'd be more than happy to, if you would, you know, reach out um, to, to see how, you know, uh, existing federal policy impacts, um, you know, state efforts that you have going on in your state. Um, if you're curious about what other states are up to on a certain policy issue, we can definitely um, provide that for you all. Um, facil uh, facilitation and strategic planning support. Um, you know, we've somewhat similar to today's convening. Um, Sophia, myself, uh, and our colleagues on our team have um, flown out to, to states to deliver in person kind of one or two day, uh, all day kind of um, convenings around a certain policy topic. Um, and then we have um, multi state consortia and peer learning opportunities. That's when We'll have usually between six and eight states uh, that engage in a one or two year um, kind of uh, engagement with us um, on a specific policy topic. Um, and you know, we'll have convenings kind of throughout that project period. We'll have um, plenty of peer learning opportunities. Um, and then obviously we regularly put out research uh, and published reports, which is what I'm gonna kind of lean on next here. If we can go to the next slide. So within our workforce development and economic policy uh, program, we have the workforce development and technical assistance program, uh, which is part of what brings us here today um, with the state workforce development board. Um, and so among our kind of key focus areas are the administration of WIOA, st um, state workforce development policy and innovation, um, and then kind of coordination across different, uh, different programs that impact uh, workforce development policy making. Um, and then the services that are listed here are pretty similar to, to the ones on the last, next slide, uh, last slide. Uh, so we can go to the next one. Great. So what you see here is um, a publication uh, that Sophia, my colleague Jordan Morang, Rachel Stevens Parker, and myself put out um, in January of this year. Um, and so before just kind of highlighting the three buckets of policy levers that you see there on the left side of the screen, um, I would just say that, you know, Sophia, Jordan, and myself undertook, um, you know, about a month and a half um, discovery phase where we really kind of scrutinized um, the WIOA statute and final rule kind of all through the lens of um, 
looking for high impact opportunities for governors to lean into the WIOA system um, to carry out their vision for workforce development. Um, and so, as you can see, one of the three buckets there um, is ensuring quality service delivery to employers and job seekers by overseeing system performance and accountability. Um, and so I think that of, of those three, you know, kind of buckets there, I, I would say is most uh, relevant for our discussion. And Sophia is going to get into more detail on that here in just a second. Um, but just kind of dig in a little bit before handing it over to Sophia here. Um, one of the opportunities that we outline in our publication um, are, is, um, you know, the opportunity to establish performance metrics and standards uh, that align with the governor's vision for workforce development. And I would frankly add that, you know, perhaps um, adding metrics and standards um, that might be more measurable uh, than the ones that are required by the statute that, that are listed here on the right side of the screen um, are, is a strategy that we've seen taken up uh, in other states, along with aligning those metrics with existing metrics for other programs um, and just kind of putting, um, you know, uh, 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 they're putting the governor's mark on the workforce system by including additional metrics. Um, and so I think from there, Sophia, if we go to the next slide, I think I, this is where I turn it over to you, I believe. Thanks, Jack. Um, so just to zoom in on the we all are required performance indicators that Jack just um, referenced. Uh, these might be familiar to you. They might be pretty self-explanatory, but these are the required um, data that all six WIOA core title programs are required to report to USDOL. Uh, they report the first five indicators on a quarterly and an annual basis, and then they report the uh, effectiveness in serving employers uh, indicators on an annual basis. Um, so quickly, just to run through these, their uh, employment rates in Q2 and Q4 after exit. Uh, these are for reference after exit is for uh, participants uh, participating in WIOA programs, WIOA supported programs. Uh, then we also have median earnings in Q2 after exit for those program participants. Uh, credential attainment, this can uh, be a high school diploma or a GED or any other uh, recognized post-secondary credential, like a second post-secondary degree, um, any sort of certification, um, a registered apprenticeship. Uh, and then fifth is measurable skills gain. Um, this is perhaps the, the broadest category uh, and covers a whole range of uh, metrics, including, uh, you know, moving up a grade level for secondary students, earning a high school diploma, meeting a credit requirement for a post-secondary program, uh, meeting any sort of milestone in a program like an apprenticeship or uh, an OJT, uh, or passing any sort of occupational or technical uh, exam related to the training program. Uh, I will say that for all five of these uh, indicators that are related to participant performance in programs, uh, and participant outcomes in programs, uh, the agencies are required to to collect a whole range of demographic information. So that includes uh, gender, uh, race and ethnicity, education level, um, and then a whole host of kind of barriers to employment related indicators, uh, such as, you know, status as a veteran, status as having a disability, status as an ex-offender, uh, whether someone is a TANF recipient, a whole host of uh, those types of demographics. Um, and then on the employer side, uh, currently USDOL is piloting, as they say, their um, effectiveness in serving employers metrics. So right now, uh, states are only required to report on two of the three that you see here. Um, and then it's at the state and governor's discretion if they would like to develop their own uh, third metric that they'd like to report on. So uh, the three options for states to choose from are uh, retention rates in Q2 and Q4 after exit, um, these are based on wage records that the state uh, collects through their departments of labor. Um, we have repeat business customers within three years. So these are, you know, businesses who are utilizing um, the one stop uh, multiple times within a three year period. And then the employer penetration rate, which just refers to uh, the percentage of the state's total employers who are utilizing the number and percentage of the total employers who are using. Um, My water delivery day is on services. Friday, and I just wanted to... Could uh, everybody mute their phone who's not speaking? Thank you. Thanks. Um, oops, I'm not able to... There we go. Um, so as you may know, and as Jack just referenced, um, WIOA does extend some flexibility to governors to uh, add additional indicators to those six required indicators that we just went over 
um, in their state plans. So you'll see here it's it's referenced both in this the WIOA statute itself and in the final rule. Um, and in the final rule, the U.S. Department of Labor kind of went a step further, explicitly calling out the governor as having this authority. So from our perspective as NGA, this provides kind of a great opportunity for state workforce, state workforce boards and governors to, um, you know, really think through whether or not these six required indicators are really, uh, you know, uh, moving you, the needle. You really in, ball the shit, bro. And achieving uh, the customer's the sorry in achieving the governor's vision for workforce um and achieving you know the vision that uh, this the state board is laying out um so jack referenced this earlier but when when states are considering whether or not to add additional performance indicators um you know some some guidance could be to you know again ensure that these indicators are aligning with the governor's overall vision for workforce Mute. development for the state outside of or uh, including but expanded beyond wiela um, and also uh, any opportunity to align metrics with um you that head is shining my bro indicators for other programs um including you know perkins or, or any other um, apprenticeship related requirements um at the state or federal level so a handful oh and i will also say uh you know as i referenced earlier the state board uh has a uh authority granted to it under WIOA, both in the statute and the final rule um, to play a role in uh, accountability for the WIOA system. Um, and NGA also um, has a high performing board framework that we um, that we developed a couple of years ago and that we work through with states who are looking to kind of optimize the role of the state board. Um, and in there, we see one of the three key roles for state boards as being to set measurable goals and priorities and then to evaluate those, uh, uh, the performance. Hey, um, uh, I, just, I just got a question in alignment with those goals and priorities. Uh, Chair uh, Anderson, if I may, if anyone is speaking out of turn, so and shiny, if anyone is utilizing any type of curse words, Lisa, you, you can mute. You Lisa, you can mute your mic. Lisa, you can mute. Sorry. Sorry, Sophia, please proceed. Okay, um, so just to share a couple of state examples for states who have chosen to add um, additional performance metrics into their WIOA state plans. Um, I will say that right now there are only about four or five states who have actually pursued this, but there are a number who are also considering um, adding, adding additional metrics. So you'll see in Arizona, they've developed uh, three additional metrics for measuring effectiveness in serving employers. Those include um, average number of days to fill job openings that they've posted with the assistance of one-stop staff, um, the percentage of employers who uh, contacted a one-stop who then received uh, qualified applicants as a result of that service, um, and then a, a metric related to worksite visits by uh, representatives of the state workforce agency. Um, in Massachusetts, they, um, again, in, uh, in relation to individual performance, uh, they have a metric related to whether or not individuals um, have secured employment in a job that relates to the training program uh, that they completed with, uh, with the assistance from WIOA. Um, and they also add SNAP recipients to kind of the list of demographics that they collect. So WIOA requires states to collect information on TANF recipients, but they have also added SNAP to that list. Um, and then in Texas, you'll see they have a whole bunch of um, uh, metrics related to uh, effectiveness in serving employers. Um, and these are pretty specific and they don't give much detail. Um, so if folks are interested in what any of those uh, metrics mean specifically, we're happy to, um, to reach out to our, our uh, colleagues in Texas and see if we can get that information for you. Pardon me, Sophia, do you want us to hold our questions until you get through the presentation? Yeah, this is going to be my last slide, and then I'm happy to, to take questions and open it up for discussion. Uh, thanks, Ken. Um, so lastly, uh, one way that we've seen states, um, uh, state boards uh, play a more active role in system accountability, whether or not they choose to add uh, additional metrics into their WIOA state plan is developing a board strategic plan, and I saw that's an item uh, on your agenda for later today. So uh, hopefully we can continue that conversation at that point. But um, a lot of these uh, state, state strategic plans that boards are developing uh, work with the governor to establish a vision goal and metrics for the state workforce system beyond what uh, what's included in WIOA or what, what's in the purview of WIOA. 
Um, a great or a, a plus of uh, engaging in this type of strategic plan is that you can engage a broader range of stakeholders than are required uh, for the WIOA process. So uh, when we're thinking about perhaps, you know, metrics to better measure um, how we're engaging employers and serving employers, uh, this is an opportunity to engage, you know, not only the employers that serve on the board, but, you know, broader groups of employers, you know, sector groups, chambers, um, a whole host of, of employers, as well as, you know, community groups that may not be included in the WOS stakeholder process, but who are serving some of the groups with greater barriers to employment uh, that the state might want to be targeting through their state, through their state plan or their strategic plan, um, and better want to better want to better track um, outcomes for those, uh, those target populations. And then when it comes to tracking that progress and measuring outcomes uh, for these strategic plans, we've seen a lot of states um, use dashboards or other tools to track the progress um, and to collect the collect and display the data, both for the for board members, but also kind of for the broader uh, public, whether that's the employer customer or the worker customer. So a great example of this is Kentucky. Uh, the Kentucky board has uh, put forward a strategic plan. It's a five year plan that includes specific metrics related to the, the goals and the objectives that they've laid out. Mm -hmm. uh, they've then worked with their state uh, labor agency to stand up a Kentucky workforce dashboard that um, you know, not only displays information related to the WIOA core programs, but also um, you know, other federal and state workforce programs and specific uh, data related to the metrics that the board has laid out in their plan. Um, and they're currently going through a continuous improvement process to not only track where they've uh, where they are kind of halfway through this strategic plan five-year period, but also to ensure that they're aligning uh, their WIOA vision and goals um, in this next round of updates to the WIOA state plans uh, with the goals that the board has already identified in their strategic plan. So kind of a, a little microcosm of all of these best practices uh, in one in Kentucky. So again, happy to, to uh, connect you with folks in Kentucky if you all want to uh, chat with them about kind of how they've worked through this with their board. Okay, so that's where I'll stop. Happy to take uh, questions or, or engage uh, in discussion across the group. Ken, jump in. Yes, uh, thanks again, Sophia. Good to see you and Jack again. Uh, what I was going to do is ask, because we were having this question, it's very fortuitous that you were going to be here. We were asked, We were having the discussion and asking the question, for the goals as well as for the objectives, should those show up in the compliance oriented state plan document, or should we try to put them in the state or the uh, strategic plan that we hope to develop, or is it a hybrid? Just looking for some insight, and obviously we welcome getting connected to Kentucky. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jack, feel free to jump in too, but um, I think Ideally, those two plans would be aligned, right? If we're all working toward the same vision, you would want, you know, not only your WIOA state plan, but any other like workforce related plan to all be working toward the same vision and goals. So ideally, yes, your WIOA state plan vision and goals would be aligned with, with whatever you're putting forward in your strategic plan. I think this is a lot easier said than done. And I think we can point to like four or five states who currently have those vision and goals like mirrored pretty well in both plans. Um, but I think, you know, obviously there are some challenges in uh, uh, kind of working across partners to get those uh, those board vision and goals put into a state plan. So, uh, again, we can provide you with some examples of states who've successfully done this, but I think a lot of states um, are still kind of working through how to kind of get all partners on board and kind of work through a process that's going to work for everybody and make sure that uh, states are, you know, staying true to the vision and the goals that the, the board and governor has put forward, but also um, kind of meeting the requirements and kind of the operational needs of, of the WIOA state plan. Sophia, this is Hugh Anderson for the record. Uh, you mentioned that a couple of the states that have started down this path, you don't have a lot of detail on the metrics they're developing or their dashboards or so or so forth but are there any states that you are intimately knowledgeable about who are being very effective in terms of developing the data and the criteria by which they can measure success yeah so so kentucky is a great example there are a couple of, of other states like wisconsin and virginia who have pretty uh extensive you know data collection and reporting processes that are um that that we would say are really well um 
presented in terms of like being usable to board members and to employers and to like kind of consumers. They're not just like these big LMI reports that are super dense and kind of meaningless to consumers. Um, so we can share some of those examples with you. I think for the Kentucky example specifically, and we're happy to share a copy of their strategic plan, but they get really, really specific with the metrics that they've included in their strategic plan. So things like increasing apprentice, registered apprenticeship programs uh, by five times or 40% uh, of Kentucky youth will be in a work-based learning program by X date. So um, there's some really you know, interesting and specific uh, examples that are included in Kentucky's plan and others that um, you know, drill down a little bit deeper than what you see in the required uh, performance indicators under WIOA. And Jack, you can jump in if you can think of any other examples. Yeah, thanks, Sophia. The only state I think I'd add to that list is Oregon. Um, so in, in follow-up, I think we can just kind of put together um, some material from them as well. If there are any other questions, I would just say that it's exciting to know that y'all are thinking about this, because frankly, when we put together the publication um, that, that I highlighted in my portion of the presentation, we kind of, you know, pick, picked, you know, what we thought were the highest impact opportunities. And then I think this is one that we kind of weighed our options on in terms of, you know, just how many state boards, how many governors would want to take up an effort to kind of use that policy lever to define success for the WIOA system as granted. Um, by the statute and final rule. And so we're super eager to be helpful. And again, just really excited that this is an effort that you all are thinking about um, in Nevada. Yeah, absolutely. Vice Chair uh, Ken Evans, for the record, very quickly, Jack, what I'll share with you is we have three subcommittees. We have the Strategic Planning Committee, and that's the committee that not only, and I want to give uh, kudos to Chair Ol Nancy Olson, not only is she trying to make sure that we get the compliance state plan aspect done, but do it in a more strategic manner, but is also open to uh, the direction to try to uh, materialize or create a strategic plan. The other two groups we have very quickly is we have a child care working group, which you know we talked about while we were there, and we've made great strides with that. And then finally, we have the uh, barriers and underserved and there's a Project 354 initiative, which has identified that one of the categories that we're really concerned about, and we have a total of three, is uh, African-American males between the ages of 18 to 24 in the South, and then uh, Latinx or Latino males in the same age group in the North. That's great, Ken. Thank you. And. Uh... Going back to your slide from Texas, uh, one of their objectives was the uh, child care parent reemployment, as Ken just alluded to. Uh, that is a, a primary uh, project we are working on with one of our subgroups. If, uh, if there's a way to connect with them to find out what they are in fact measuring and how they're going about it, that would be very helpful to us. Of course, we can definitely make that uh, connection for you guys. Excellent. Any other questions from the committee? Well, thank you both for a wonderful presentation and uh, staying late for us. Of course. Thank you all. Thanks so much. Have a good evening. You too. All right. Are we clear? Okay. Well, this is my first experience with public meetings where we have hecklers. My apologies for any uh, offense that anybody took from whoever those people were. Maybe they're getting educated as we speak. So moving on to agenda item number eight for discussion and information only, the chair uh, recognizes uh, Ken Evans, Vice Chair Ken Evans to present the strategic planning vision for the board. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Anderson. Uh, I, I think we uh, touched on it, but just very quickly, uh, what we're looking to do with the Strategic Planning Committee, and again, kudos to uh, Chair Olson, is twofold. 
on the one hand, we know we need to meet the requirement for the compliance aspect of the state plan, but we want to try to do it in a manner that's a bit more cohesive in the way it's put together, as well as the language of the plan is a bit more strategic in nature so that it's paid attention to on the back end for action, impact, and results and accountability. Uh, the second aspect is, again, there is an appetite to see if we can put together the two or three page, maybe a little longer, but not too much longer page strategic plan. And again, we want to benchmark off of what is already out there. So we had a very good meeting uh, just yesterday or the day before yesterday, and the group is definitely headed in the, a good direction to, again, get the state plan aspect done, but at the same time, do it in a strategic, comprehensive, cohesive manner so that we work together and produce some results on the back end. Thank you, Ken. Any questions for Ken? And again, I'd like to reiterate uh, thanks for the hard work in making that report uh, something that uh, we can use. All right, moving on to agenda item number nine, for discussion and information only, the chair recognizes the executive director of GOIN, Lisa Levine, to provide updates from GOIN concerning the, the governor's workforce development board, child care working group, and Empower Research Grants. Lisa? Thank you, Chair. Um, I also just want to briefly let everyone know that this will be the last meeting where people who are not on the agenda or a board member have access to this link. Moving forward, we're going to have two links. That's the best practice. So I very much apologize to all members, um, Chair Anderson. Uh, that was just so inappropriate. So I am just so sorry, everyone. We will be better next time. Um, briefly for me, uh, the child care policy report came out in February. Kudos to everyone who uh, put in time and dedication for that. Uh, we received so much positive um, response from the community, uh, certainly from the press as well. There were articles um, in the Reno Gazette Journal, the Las Vegas Review Journal, as well as an editorial from the RJ, which was pretty incredible, uh, KNPR, multiple TV outlets across the state, northern, southern, and rural Nevada. Uh, and certainly, um, I hear some rumors that there might be an op-ed coming out as well, so more to come on that, but definitely, um, a lot of great uh, positive responses there. Um, just some updates as well on that. Uh, the report was sent to all policymakers in the state from local governing bodies as well as to our state lawmakers. Um, Heidi Kasama in the legislature is interested in having a meeting with leadership from the child care working group. Uh, she's really excited um, and enthusiastic about the report and some of the findings and policy recommendations. Some more to come as well. Uh, we're working on, there's discussions around a pilot um, that Chair Anderson, uh, that's really been driven by, by you. So thank you for that. More to come as well. Um, and then working with some of our business associations on hopefully a 45F business symposium uh, to increase federal dollars into the state of Nevada to support expanding access and increasing access uh, for child care. Um, and then on the NPOWER uh, work that we've done, also really exciting. Uh, the full Governor's Workforce Development Board heard um, a little report from DB Driven, who's our vendor for NPower, back in October of last year. And since then, we've really kind of kicked it off. Uh, in December of last year, we launched um, the research portal where academics and research organizations can pull the data so that now it's public facing. Uh, we launched um, our research uh, inaugural research grants, which we received funding uh, during the December IFC meeting. Um, and then we also increased our data partners to include the Department of Corrections, the Department of Veteran Services, and the DMV. Uh, in addition to that, last year we did our research forums, our inaugural research forums uh, in both Reno and in Las Vegas. Um, 2023, the great work continues. Uh, of the research grants, eight different organizations were uh, awarded. Two doctoral students, UNLV, UNR, Brookings, Lindsay, uh, and the Gwynn Center. In addition, our website portal site from December and January have received um, just incredible uh, momentum. Uh, we've gained 125% in um, new uh, people going onto the website, um, which is really great. I think that exemplifies that we're getting out of our ecosystem and our little echo chamber and more people are learning about Empower uh, and trying to, trying to use it. 
Um, and then in addition to that, we are going to have research forums again, December 5th and December 7th of this year, more to come. The research forums last year were more about how we can better utilize NPower. The research forums this year will include all of the findings that the research grants funded. Um, and then in addition to that, we hope to um, publish a research agenda, kind of like an academic journal, if you will, but not an academic journal for the PhDs on the call. We obviously aren't doing that, but it'll include all of the research um, in a full published report uh, that these, these academics are putting together to move Nevada forward. That's it for me. Chair, you're muted. Oh, yes. Does anybody have any, uh, I'm trying not to cough into the meeting, so my apologies for mismuting. Does anybody have any questions for Lisa? Hearing none, Lisa, I want to thank you and your team for the cadence, uh, how you're pursuing these uh, various and sundry objectives we have, because uh, there are many, and uh, you're, you're pursuing them with a lot of energy and you and your team, so we want to thank you. Moving on to agenda item number 10, for discussion information only, the chair recognizes Executive Director of Workforce Connections, Jaime Cruz, to provide an update on the industry sector partnerships that Workforce Connections launched in 2022. Welcome, Jaime. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to present. I guess um, uh, before I forget, I'll let you know that um, I'll remind everyone that uh, Nevada Works, our, our sister workforce uh, board from the north, uh, was um, awarded, uh, I believe, somewhere around $13 million to do the very same thing up in northern Nevada. So that's good for the state that we will have regional sector partnerships, both in the south and in the north, feeding up to the Governor's Workforce Development Board to, you know, to really accomplish uh, the strategic vision of the board. So with that, I'll try to give you a quick update of what happened uh, with us so far. Uh, next slide, please. Unless I'm driving. Okay, thank you. And so um, if you're familiar with the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy published by the LBGEA here in Southern Nevada, uh, we have seven target sectors. Uh, we have a workforce blueprint that is now in its third edition. Uh, most recent uh, it was updated last year. You can find it by going to workforceblueprint.org. Next page, please. Uh, the summary of what happened last year in 22, basically it was a very a uh, heavy lift to, to launch seven industry sector partnerships in one year. Uh, but the good news is that we, we were successful because I think we did it really as a region together. It wasn't just Workforce Connections. We uh, led the initiative, but we're grateful to have partners in all of our chambers of commerce, the Vegas Chamber, the Urban Chamber, the Latin Chamber, the Henderson Chamber, the Asian Chamber, our municipalities, our Henderson Chamber, uh, you know, even GOID uh, was, was involved and present in the meetings, uh, the Clark County School District, CSN, UNLV, Nevada State College. And so really that uh, regional community effort is what helped us be successful. I think some of you have been around for years and it's very difficult to, to launch these or it has been difficult to launch them at the state level because uh, state policy mandated that you do it under Robert rules, right? Similar to the meeting we have now, which as you uh, as can see is exposed not to, to what we experience today, but also to uh, something that businesses are really not accustomed to. Um, again, Ken, as the previous president of the Urban Chamber can tell you, he doesn't convene his businesses under Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, it, it's a different deal. They, they serve cocktails, they have energy, there's food. And, you know, businesses are accustomed to not usually what government uh, provide. And so we really wanted to be different. We uh, wanted to uh, convene businesses just like the chambers convene businesses, just like the LBGA convene businesses. So we picked the next generation partnership model, a uh, nationally recognized model with lots of success stories across the nation of regions that have done this. And it worked for us. The bottom line is that model is employer driven. A lot of times employers stop coming to industry sector uh, initiatives because they feel being preached to. They, they spend an hour listening to long reports and long forecasting and listening to every training provider about what they already have on the shelf and should be buying from them. Instead, the next generation partnership model says, let the employers tell you what they want to buy. Let them tell you what they need. 
So that's why that model is successful. That's why we were able to find 12 to 15 employers from each one of those seven sectors. They represented small, medium, and, size, and large businesses. We also wanted to make sure that within those sectors, we had diversity, meaning in the healthcare sector, we didn't want all hospitals in the room. We wanted hospitals, we wanted pharmaceutical manufacturing, we wanted hospices, we wanted you know, different cares, um, all different things. The same in manufacturing. There's manufacturers of, of clothing, of juices, of chocolates, of, of machines like Haas. And so really finding multiple types of uh, companies within that industry. And at the end of the day, our goal, uh, according to this national model, is to identify common needs. After all, we do have limited resources here, uh, at least the boards, uh, as you know, you've heard me say many times, the boards, uh, the local boards only receive 20% of the big WIOA fund, fund, uh, you know, funding package, if you will. And so we know that we can't do everything. And so we just said, since we only control those funds, let's find common needs by which we can move on opportunities for the collective impact. We can't uh, do a different thing for every employer or every sector. We really wanted to find what one or two or three things can we move on that would impact every sector and as many businesses as possible. Next sheet, please. So that was 2022. So what we found out uh, was that all of them, and this is no surprise to you, they they are they need labor, they need talent. Everybody's short on talent, even us here at Workforce Connection. So, how do we solve that? Obviously, uh, unfortunately, we can't. We don't, there's no 3D printers to 3D print humans yet. So uh, there's also you know not a, a bunch of people immigrating to our country willing to you know uh, uh, to come and take these jobs anymore. Uh, things are, have changed. Uh, immigration was a, a part of how this country was built. It's, it's uh, you know, we used to make more babies too. Birthing rates have declined in this nation over decades. Uh, more people are retiring. And so it's a perfect storm of a shortage of labor that won't go away soon. So uh, even though artificial intelligence is one of the ways that we can mitigate and fill some of those jobs, it's not enough. So we really have to tap alternate labor pools, labor pools that traditionally have not been our go-to. And that means uh, the re-entry population. That means people with disabilities. That means our returning vets. That means, again, immigrants that have, you know, uh, refugees that have permission to work here. Uh, most of all, that means our youth. We have uh, over 42,000 dis uh, disconnected youth here in Southern Nevada, between these mountains that surround us, between the ages of 16 and 24, that are not enrolled in school or skill acquisition and are not employed. Let me say that again. 42,000 able bodies are here in our valley, not being a part of the labor shortage that employers are clamoring for. So again, access to alternate labor pools was something every employee, every employer in every sector had a common need for. The next one was they really need assistance with recruitment, hiring, training, because that's not cheap, it's expensive. Now for a company like MGM, they have the resources to do that. But a small mom and pop who had to, who really suffered through the pandemic, they need all the help they can get. Posting jobs, recruiting people, organizing job fairs, um, all these things. And so that was the second common need. Another one was, they said, even the workforce that we have, uh, we would like to upskill them so that we can uh, also help retain them. We want to be able to, grow them in our company, make room for new employees, but also help with retention. And finally, all of them said, we want a more robust and sustainable pipeline of talent. We're tired of ca cannibalizing each other. Uh, I hire by competitions for a dollar more than the person next to me gives them a dollar more. And it, we're tired of it. It's just, we're wasting money and time and that's not sustainable. So uh, these are the things that we identified across all sectors. And there was more, but this is what we were going to focus on. So next page, please. So since the launch, what you've seen us working on is uh, in, the, in the first category, access to alternate labor pools. It was about, uh, they really, some of us told us, we love your big events. We're about to have another one in two weeks uh, in the beautiful West Convention Center. Over uh, 120 employers have signed up. There will be, I hear, uh, thousands of jobs uh, being offered on the spot on that day. Uh, but some businesses felt lost in that large shuffle. Again, when you're in a booth next to, I'm going to pick on MGM. I worked for MGM for 20 years, so I'm going to pick on the Sands Corporation or Caesars. 
uh, it's tough to compete with them. If you're mom and pop uh, looking for employees, so they said, can you do something for us? Can you do a, a smaller, more targeted, more sector specific, more customized hiring event? So we've had several of those over the last few months for several of our industry sectors, and that those have proven to be uh, very uh, productive for them. We also, again, as I said earlier, we have, um, if any of you, I know some of you are members of my board, and so of the local, of uh, the Southern Local Board, and, I, and you know that we are currently in the process of our, our um, investment cycle. So we're uh, uh, awarding the contracts that will staff our American job centers, and some of them are specific about reentry programs. We're actually doubling down, at least that's been the recommendation of the Programs Committee, that will go in front of the board next uh, week to double down on the reentry programs. There's a large uh, segment of people who have paid their debt to society. And quite frankly, it's uh, not just a social imperative, but a business imperative. Because if we are paying for somebody to be incarcerated, we're also probably paying to support their family since they can't support them. So really investing in that, uh, in that person and move them and their families from being part of the tax burden to being part of the tax base from being dependent to independent, uh, though that's really a, a really good business imperative. And it's evidence because it's supported here by our local chambers uh, as well. Uh, the next thing was, we uh, so we connected the employers to these programs. Uh, we're also in, in about to launch a really huge campaign with our partners at the Regional Transportation Commission of Southern Nevada. Really grateful to MJ Maynard and Angela Castro there who are uh, picking up the cost of a huge campaign to target these 42,000 plus individuals. So you're gonna see soon posters on every bus, on every bus stop, on every transit center that says, are you between 16 and 24? You, you know, are you ready for a paycheck? Come and see us, right? We, we got a paycheck, we got a career for you. So that's something we're doing again to try to connect employers to, these, uh, to that labor uh, that's available there. And so at the end of the day, a lot of this happens through the American Job Centers. And as you know, uh, last year, all American job centers in the state of Nevada have been now unified under the same state brand of Employee MV. So we have the Employee MV business hubs that focus on the businesses. We have the Employee MV career hubs that focus on the adult job seeker. And of course, the Employee MV youth hubs, which are on the young generation. Next slide, please. The second uh, comment, uh, and my apologies, I did this in my Mac, and I can see now how the formatting is different on, on Microsoft. So. Um, uh, so the next category was assistance with recruitment, hiring, and training new employees. Again, mom and pop needs all the help they can get in being able to spend uh, or cover the cost of what it, talks, what it takes to recruit and train new people. And so we connected, uh, we offered to connect every member of our industry sector partnerships with an account manager from an, our employee and B business hubs for them to be their one-on-one -on -one concierge and at no cost meet their HR needs. And that's been a great help to many small companies. Again, connecting them to the WIOA programs that we, uh, con that we administer, right? The, the boards administer Title I. Uh, we're very fortunate here in Southern Nevada that our dealer partners have, have moved their Title III resources and staff into our employee MV business hubs. So now it's, we're all one team under one brand. And, and the, uh, the, the public, the businesses don't have to worry about who works for who and where do you get your paycheck. We're just one big team uh, ready to serve you. Uh, one of the things that came out of the industry sector partnerships, again, because the employer said we need help, is the city of Las Vegas uh, gave us $1 million to run a pilot for small businesses uh, out of their American Recovery uh, Act money to again, help them uh, recover from all the economic uh, effects of the pandemic. Because even though the masks and the machines are gone, we, there's still, there was, there's an economic effect, meaning there's a labor shortage. There's, a, there's all these things that we need to do. And so we're helping small businesses with that, uh, with that, with those funds. And I have a small video there, a 60 second video I'll show you that has gone out. This is what the message we're, we're, we're uh, giving to those small businesses.
I mean, there is no sound. Was there supposed to be sound? Yeah, there's sound, but um, it's not uh, a deal killer. I mean, um, it's all in there. But yeah, maybe if we can find out next video, if we can get sound. Not a big problem, though. The Employee MB Business Hub team is ready to help you. Contact us and accelerate your business recovery at no cost to you. Email us at the address on the screen to verify your eligibility and learn about next steps. The enrollment period has already started, so make sure to lock in your spot. Thank you, Kate. If you can take us back to the screen. Mr. Chair, that voice talent was very expensive, but he uh, donated his time at no cost to uh, further the state of Nevada. I didn't realize Elmer Fudd was still working. <laughs> My, uh, the last thing on the, oh, one more uh, previous screen, please. I think I had one thing under um, the recovery. Another thing that we made available, if you can go back one more screen, please. Yeah, uh, the other way, the other way. There we go. So we just played the recovery pilot for a million dollars, but also we have, uh, we put together a workshop for all these employers, uh, those who are interested in apprenticeship resources. There is, uh, we brought three intermediaries that are, uh, that have resources already allocated to them uh, to do apprenticeships. And I know Mr. Chair, uh, with you and Lisa, uh, next Monday, I believe we'll be meeting at the Vegas Chamber with other stakeholders to perhaps even bring more apprenticeship resources through going to the table uh, for employers who are interested in that. Uh, next screen, please. So uh, the third category was again, existing employees. How can you help me with my existing employees? I am really grateful that we have existing resources in our system through uh, the, the, at the Employee MB Business Hub with uh, we owe a Title I, we owe a Title III. And um, we also received uh, from our partners at Dieter, they invested another half a million dollars here in the South and half a million dollars in the North to do an incumbent worker training, as we call it in our world. We felt those words uh, the, didn't mean anything to the employers. The employers kept asking us about upskilling. So again, we're trying to learn from the chambers. Let's not call the things our names. Let's call them what they understand. So we called it the upskill pilot. And again, that makes available $500,000 uh, for businesses that want to upskill their assisting employees. So if you could play that for me, Katie, please. Skill your employees at no cost to you. Increase the performance of your team through a new pilot program for incumbent worker training funded by Nevada's Department of Employment Training and Rehabilitation. Improve the safety of your operations. Raise the quality of your product. Increase the efficiency of your business. Maximize your profits. The training must result in one or more of these outcomes for your employee. Layoff aversion, title change, promotion, or wage increase. Enrollments have already started. Don't miss your chance to get your employees upskilled. Email us at upskill at theater.nv.gov. An upskilled employee is a better employee. Enroll today to upskill your team at no cost to you. Thank you, Katie. So you can see there, that's uh, $1.5 million of resources that uh, have come from outside of our regular means because of partnerships, right? Really appreciate Dieter jumping in, City of Las Vegas jumping in, our chambers jumping in, uh, the LVGA jumping in. Again, it, this has really been a regional effort. And I think that's part of why we have succeeded to the measure you see now. And again, for these existing uh, upskilling needs, the apprenticeship resources, that hopefully we'll be discussing next uh, Monday could also play a role, Lisa and Mr. Chair. Next slide, please. This is the last category, I believe. And uh, again, how do we do this in a more sustainable way? Because we know that the federal government is not going to send American recovery money every year. Uh, we're not going to have extra money. How do we really build it into our regular uh, pipeline? Well, the, the really, it was a better connectivity to the classroom. How do we make sure that the post-secondary classrooms are aligned to the needs of employers. And I'm glad to let you know that 
uh, CSN, Nevada State College, uh, and the University of Nevada, Las Vegas is already talking one-on-one -on -one with the, our, our employer members to, to see, do I have on the shelf what you need? Do I even understand exactly what you need? Because if we don't, then we want to change that. And that's, you know, really uh, pivotal, I think, in, in our evolution as a region where we really want to be employer driven. And that same applies to the earliest piece of our talent development pipeline, the K through 12 system. We have 320,000 young people in that system. And, and, and every year we graduate about 25,000 to 30,000 roughly. The historic data shows that half of those, so to use the 30,000 number for ease, half of those 15,000 have a planned uh, post-secondary uh, career. They're going to go to community college, a university, the military, an apprenticeship, vocational training. They got something planned. The other 15,000, not so much. Why can't we make those 15,000 more work ready when they graduate? Why can't, they, why can't we make them more part of the solution that employers need right now? How can we avoid them be joining the existing 42,000 that are already floating around? So that really is our priority here in our region. That's why the RTC is is helping us. That's why we, we love the fact that Chambers recognize that and are helping us. And so that's going to be our focus. And not to forget, by the way, the story with the 15 that have a plan doesn't end all well. Of the 15 that start a four-year skill acquisition process, only half are successful. So the other half, 7,500 7, joined the original 15,000 that didn't go, and now that's 22,500. So these are all reasons why we're really looking at the K through 12 system as, as a way to, again, be a part of the solution. And you can't wait until the young person is 18 to start talking to them about how we make them a part of the solution. You have to start really early, which is why we'll give you three examples of what we're doing. In the high school, one example, and these there are many initiatives, but I obviously the chair only gave me a little time. So here's one example about high school. Katie, and the sound is off again. So the idea here is this is the first of one of many uh, student showcases that we're going to be having across the valley. This one will be at Cimarron Memorial High School, which is the home of the High Rollers. They have won a city, state, national, and international robotics competitions. When you go there, you just are amazed at the skills these young people have. They can program, they can code, they can machine pieces, they can 3D print, they can assemble on the fly, they can troubleshoot, problem solve. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And so we want to connect them with employers, right? We want to make sure that they meet the employers, not at the day of their graduation, but hopefully way before that. And so I'll move, I'll move to the next one, which ties into that. In middle schools, uh, we want to be able to start that conversation and connect the middle school classroom with industry and our employers. So we're using this platform. Obviously, uh, some of you are very familiar with it. It's Nepris for Nevada. Uh, Go in the Department of Education you know, brought it to our state. And we're just, again, making sure that the largest district in the state, which is the Clark County School District, is uh, committed to it. Uh, we have now gotten to that point where we're working with them to sign up all the schools and working with our employers or our industry to make sure as many employers are involved, because that's what we need. We need to connect the classrooms to the industry experts across of our state or here for us in our region. Uh, the next one, if we can go back to the presentation, is uh, the elementary schools. And some people will say, what are you doing in elementary schools? Do we really belong in there? I mean, aren't they just playing games? Not really. If you look at a 10-year-old, at a, at a 
they find out more from TikTok and Instagram that you, that you and I knew at 10 years old. You have to influence them early. You have to get there and start to uh, plant the seeds about what could they be when they grow up. What are the opportunities for them in our region and also their families, by the way. And so to do that, uh, we took our workforce blueprint that we update, uh, again, partnership between our the LVGA, our chambers, go with, and we made something, we worked with the school district to make it uh, relatable to, to kids. How do we make a workforce blueprint for kids and start to expose them to the industries, the occupations with those on these industries and the skill sets needed for those occupations. And so I'll show you a video of something will be released right after spring break. You're getting a sneak peek, but you'll see this being released by the Clark County School District uh, to all principals of, element, of uh, 150 plus elementary schools here in Southern Nevada. If you can click on that last link, uh, Katie, please. And again, you might not be hearing uh, the sound, but it's all in there and the, um, the message is in there. Very good. Thank you, Katie. And I think if we go to my last slide to finish up, um, I think there's just two more things I wanted to mention to you. The next, yep, this is the last slide. So uh, we also, uh, again, as those of you who were familiar with the old Bishop Gorman High School decades ago, uh, on, its, on its grounds was built the latest school here in Southern Nevada. It's called the Central Career Technical Academy. It's a beautiful school that also houses Global Community High School for immigrant young um, uh, young people. And so over the years here at Workforce and Actions, we received many uh, grants and uh, we, uh, we have kind of acquired, if you will, a large collection of STEM labs and equipment valued up to a quarter of a million dollars over, over a decade. And so we uh, really felt that, uh, by the way, this school was built, the first school in the nation to be built to house an American job center. Let me say that again, nowhere in the nation has that happened, right? We were the first region in the nation to have an American Job Center and a Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we are, are the first one to scale libraries like we have here to be in city halls in Henderson and North Las Vegas and the city of Las Vegas uh, West Historic um, School. Uh, there's just a lot of firsts. This again, the first uh, school in the nation to host an American Job Center. So we uh, felt uh, it was uh, probably the best home for our, our uh, labs and equipment. And every time we get pictures from the principal and the kids building robots, it's really rewarding. So this is part of our investment into, again, our future. We also, again, thanks to our partners at Dieter, we were able to bring another quarter million dollars of vocational training equipment and programming to their academic centers. These are schools that you might remember them being called behavioral centers. Uh, to, they've changed that name. But again, this is a way to maybe take those kids who are not fitting the traditional high school and still make them a part of the solution for what employers need today. And then finally, if you haven't heard, uh, we have a great initiative that is getting a lot of national recognition called the Clark County School District Fellowship Initiative. And this graduates fellows, as we call them. They're some of our best high school counselors from Ed Need High Schools. And we immerse them for nine months into the public workforce system. They're in American job centers, they're in local boards, they're really learning what this system can do for young people and their families. And when they graduate, they become part of our team. They're just not on our payroll. They're on the payroll of the school district. Again, we have limited resources. So they're, they're one of our folks now. They know our system. They can connect the kids. They can connect the families. And uh, how do you know it's good? Well, when people put their money where their mouth is, right? The San Manuel Band of Mission Indians, who are the new owners of the Palms, love this idea, love the investment in young people. Uh, believe that it's a solution. It's a, it's a solution for them as employers, 
And so they gave us $50,000 to do 10 more of those fellows this year. Next slide, please. I think that's my end. So I tried to go quick, Mr. Chair. There's more, but I, as you said, make it quick, Jaime. And so I'll stop right there. Hopefully uh, I was able to uh, share what you wanted to hear. Thank you, Jaime. Who has questions for Jaime? You bowled them over as usual, Jaime. Your workforce connections and uh, is a vital uh, partner for the workforce board because you you and your uh, team are the boots on the ground that deliver the intel that we need to know on what's working, what's not working, and how we can help uh, pursue the mission. So thank you for that information. Thank you for being so innovative and uh, rightly so. You've been nationally recognized for a lot of these initiatives. So great job. Thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Chair. And great jersey. <laughs> All right. Moving on to item number 11. For discussion and information only, the chair would like to get some feedback from the executive committee based on all the great information that was presented today or how the board has been going so far this year. And just basically to make sure that uh, the initiatives that we've laid out and that we're pursuing uh, conform to what you think is, a, is going to be effective for good workforce development in our state. So I'll open up the floor for any comments or questions. Um, I have some, but I want to hold back and let other members uh, provide feedback. No seeing none at this point, Ken, you can jump in. Okay. Uh, Jaime, great presentation. Uh, as always, you're innovative and on the cutting edge, if not creating the cutting edge. Uh, I feel like we're moving in the uh, right direction. I definitely like the fact that we're trying to connect to youth and young people as early as possible, because that's part of the key uh, to several of the initiatives we had. So uh, kudos to that. I like the direction we're going in. Anyone else? Thank you, Ken. All right, hearing none. Before moving on, the chair kindly requests that any member of the executive committee who arrived late after roll call was taken to please identify themselves at this time so you're marked present. Katie, I believe you've accounted for everybody, correct? Thank you. And moving on to number 12, members of the public are invited for final comments except the people who are being obnoxious. Any public comments on the telephone or Zoom? All right, hearing no further comments, I hereby move to adjourn this meeting. Thank you all for your attention and time today. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.